Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so today I am going to be talking about improving macOS security by reducing authentication prompts. So just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Michael Epping. My colleague Mark was supposed to be here with me, but unfortunately he wasn't able to make it. Uh, he has been following along on Twitter. Uh, I tried to tell him it like, wasn't really beautiful here and he wasn't buying it. Uh, so he's kind of mad that he's not here, but um, unfortunately he's not with us. So I'm presenting solo today. Uh, so I am a senior product manager in the Azure AD product group within the security division at Microsoft. And within the Azure AD product group, I'm actually on a team called Get to Production. And so what I do is I work with uh, large strategic Microsoft customers like Fortune 500 companies, banks, uh, security companies, you, know, you name it, uh, to actually implement Microsoft's features uh, that come within the Azure AD product bundle. In addition to that, I also work with our feature teams to take that customer feedback and drive it into the product and to make improvements. And I specifically work with teams that are building Mac and Linux features. Uh, if anybody's not aware, we just had a big new Linux announcement on Monday that we're now supporting uh, Azure AD registration and Intune device management for Linux, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, but really, my heart is in the Mac space. So I really want to talk about what we've been discussing with Mac OS customers uh, and our Fortune 500 customers and other strategic customers who use a lot of Macs. So I'm going to focus on a couple things. Uh, so I am going to talk about what is Azure AD and conditional access. I promise this isn't going to be like a Microsoft-specific talk. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to discuss is really about how the industry is trending in general. So you could sub in a different IDP, a different IDP vendor for a lot of the things I'm going to talk about. And what I'm going to say is still holding true in the enterprise. A lot of the focus here is on enterprise scenarios. But it could also apply to schools, nonprofits, you name it. Uh, we'll talk about why prompting is bad, and then the things that Microsoft has been working with our enterprise customers to implement. And really what I'm hoping to get out of this is a better understanding about what we're doing in the enterprise space and what Apple's building in the enterprise space, specifically around identity, and then hopefully uh, pique some interest among people here, because I think there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, let's say, investigating some of the tools that uh, are being used in this space. So to start out, Azure AD is not Active Directory in the cloud. I get this all the time from customers um, or any random person I might talk to. They think we're just running a bunch of domain controllers in our data center. That is not it. Azure AD is an identity service. It's an IDP uh, fundamentally, just like uh, there's many other IDPs on the market. It's not just for Office 365. For a lot of the uh, major enterprise customers we work with, they are investing in migrating lots and lots of resources to be integrated with Azure AD. So yes, there could be integrations with on-prem environments, but we're also talking about SaaS applications, device identity, consumer identity, partner identities. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the cloud space. A big trend that our industry has seen is that resources are moving to the cloud uh, in ever greater numbers. Devices are proliferating, and especially in the last couple of years, users are working outside the office. A lot of the old security paradigms that the security teams we talked to uh, leveraged in the past, like protecting everything behind the firewall and the corporate network, don't really apply anymore. For a lot of our customers, the way the industry is moving is towards identity being the control plane rather than the, rather than the network perimeter. So yes, what's going on on the devices is really critical. Yes, uh, what's going on on the app servers is really critical. But for a lot of the security teams we work with, identity and building policy around identity and who can access what from what device is really the core of their security strategy going forward. Azure AD, like um, pretty much all of the other vendors out there, is built on open standards. Open standards are really the uh, lifeblood that makes this whole thing work. Uh, all of us need to be able to work with any SaaS application out there. Uh, it's really important that we, uh, that we use these open standards and not uh, just build our own proprietary protocols. So for example, Microsoft's own cloud services are all built on OpenID Connect. So if you use Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, et cetera, et cetera, uh, those are all OpenID Connect uh, OAuth applications. We're also really active in some standards bodies. So the FIDO Alliance is a really big thing for us. Uh, we really want to do this thing called passwordless, where we stop having users using password-based credentials uh, because it turns out that they're really easy to steal. Um, but we're also participating in some other standards bodies as well. A big, another big one is Decentralized Identity Foundation. 
Um, in the password list space and the FIDO space, uh, there was actually a big joint announcement from Microsoft, Apple, Google, and the FIDO Foundation back in May around a new type of credential called a passkey. Uh, if you've followed Apple's uh, WWDC announcements, there's a lot of discussion about their implementation of this as well. So there's a lot of things evolving here in the identity space. For Azure AD specifically, uh, the thing that is really at the heart of our tool set is what's called conditional access. So this is basically Microsoft's zero trust authentication and authorization engine. It's the thing that looks at what are the conditions under which a user is trying to access a resource, and it then makes a decision about what they need to do in order to actually get access to that resource. And this could mean that we apply one policy if the user's on a Windows device, a different policy if they're on a Mac device, a different policy if they're on an unknown device. Um, it also means that we can evaluate things like risk. Like we have a machine learning engine that is evaluating every sign-in and every user to determine risk. We have a huge data set since we have one of the largest identity services in the world to build some of these ML models on. Uh, we do have integrations with lots of devices, and I'm gonna talk about the Mac integration in a moment. And then there's other things you can do uh, with this as well. One of the things that we really strive for is evaluating trust every time a user or device requests access to a resource. So we need to constantly be checking to see, should I intervene and stop this user from accessing a resource? Like, is their endpoint in an unhealthy state? Like uh, the antivirus says that there's something wrong and we need to now shut off their access to cloud resources. Um, and we need to do this on a constant basis. And the way that we do that is through the way that conditional access uh, actually uses tokens and its evaluation logic. So what administrators do in these environments is they create conditional access policies that are really just big chunks of JSON under the hood. And so you do things like define your conditions and then you uh, decide what sort of policy you wanna apply or what controls you wanna apply based on those conditions. So when you do this, you can have multiple policies and they kinda all get squished together. But the fundamental thing to understand is that if you have any policies that say a user should be blocked, they'll be blocked. So just as an example, uh, I have a sign-in that I did here in my lab environment. Uh, this was on a Mac that was in an unmanaged state using the Edge browser. I signed into the Azure AD portal. You can see that Azure AD sees this device as being not compliant. So in my environment, if my devices are being configured, or my policies are being configured in such a way that devices need to be compliant, I would not be able to get access. There's other grant controls that we can put in place like evaluating risk, evaluating MFA, evaluating what type of device it is. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different options. But fundamentally, one of the things to understand is that we try to satisfy policy without user interaction. And this is really common, uh, especially on Windows devices. Like Windows is really good at integrating with Azure AD. It makes a lot of sense since we make Windows. Uh, it makes a lot of sense and uh, Windows uses its tokens to sat, uh, non-interactively satisfy these controls. So we can do things like say, identify that a device is in a managed or compliant state and then we don't need to prompt the user for MFA. This differs a little bit on Macs, which out of the box, a Mac doesn't necessarily have some of the same integrations. So we need to think about how do we manage Macs in our environment. So if you're unfamiliar with what's being done in your organization, if you use Azure AD, uh, it's always a good idea to talk to your identity and access management team to understand what those policies look like. Um, some really common ones that we recommend for customers in general are things like requiring MFA, uh, blocking legacy authentication. Um, if you use Exchange Online, this is gonna happen to uh, pretty much everybody in the near future. Block access in places where you don't do business. Uh, require that a device is in a managed state. Uh, and then where things start to get a little bit interesting for the Mac picture is stricter controls for non-corporate managed devices. So what we found with enterprise customers is it is really common for their Macs to look, at, look like they are unmanaged devices. So a common scenario that we might hear an administrator configuring a policy for would be something like, I want to allow users to uh, get access to their email uh, in a web browser if they're on an unmanaged PC. Like I might be at my parents' house to help them out with something and I just need to check my email real quick. That's fine, but we wanna nuke that session after two hours because we don't want a persistent session going on that device. 
This seems really good for security, but what we found in Azure AD uh, is that prompting is actually really bad. Uh, so we need to think about how we can improve prompting on these devices that are looking to us like they are unmanaged. So to just kind of illustrate that this problem exists in the wild, uh, we have a couple examples of tweets that we've seen. So uh, Amy said, PSA, don't blindly accept MFA requests if you're trying to log into something. Uh, very famously in the news lately, there has been an example of an organization that this happened to, and the breach is very bad. Uh, and all the attacker did was trick the user to accept an MFA request that was not initiated by the end user. Another example is, I found a company today who refreshes their end user credentials every morning, so every morning their users get a push notification to log in. This is not good. You are training your end users to accept any old MFA prompt. Uh, so that is generally not a good idea. And then we can also have productivity impacts. So uh, Reed Whiteman said, I kind of want to write an app that tracks how many hours per week I spend 2FAing into different collaboration systems. Uh, if you're a Mac user in an environment that uses Azure AD, you probably fall into this bucket where you are used to doing multiple sign-ins, multiple MFAs all the time. So we do have a real-world example that's not just pulled from Twitter. Uh, so we did talk to a European financial in, uh, industry customer who did a simulated cyber attack. So basically their red team got permission to password spray their own users and find users with weak passwords. Not the most complicated thing in the world, but in most environments this is gonna work on some decent chunk of your users. Then uh, they hammered those users with compromised passwords with MFA prompts. And the findings were pretty interesting. Uh, nobody reported anything to the help desk, uh, so that's usually not a good sign. Um, also, many users blindly approved those MFA requests. That's also really bad. And one user actually uninstalled the Authenticator app from their device, and it is not even clear how they were working anymore. Uh, <laughs> so we have this, this major problem that if we don't give the users a good end user experience uh, and we over prompt them, we're going to train them into just responding to anything or ignoring prompts when they are valid uh, we need to make sure that we're training our users to have good end user behavior. Uh, we've talked a lot uh, over the last two days about um, you know, some really cool attacks like zero day exploits and um, all sorts of incredible stuff. But uh, in our experience, the vast majority of things that actually get an organization compromised are things like this. Um, almost all of the compromises in Azure AD are due to end users getting password sprayed, organizations not using MFA, or organizations using MFA poorly. So it's really important to think about this stuff when it comes to our Mac users, in addition to the rest of our user base. So why is prompting bad? Leads to compromise. Users learn those bad behaviors. We don't want to just hit approve on random MFA requests we might receive. It also impacts productivity, especially on platforms without SSO, uh, SSO being single sign-on. Uh, prompting is especially common on macOS because macOS does not do SSO out of the box. Uh, and we need to strive to improve user experience and security. So from Microsoft's perspective, one of the ways that we do this is we prompt when needed. So the user's on a new device or they're signing in from a location they've never signed in from before or something looks particularly risky about that user's behavior. And if we do need to prompt the user, we need to try to use passwordless methods to try to make it less impactful when it is needed. So now I'm gonna talk about what we've been working with our enterprise customers to deploy to help everybody get a better understanding about where this, uh, where this is leading to in the enterprise space. So the first thing that we work with customers on is even figuring out if we have a problem. Um, especially in Fortune 500 customers uh, who are primarily Windows shops, a lot of times they are not aware of whether or not their users on Mac are having a bad experience. Uh, usually they are if the executives are using Macs, but if they're not, uh, then a lot of times uh, central IT is not always aware. So one of the things we built is pre-built data in Azure AD to help IT organizations figure this out. Uh, so we have pre-built workbooks that can use all the data that's in your own Azure AD tenant to uh, give you the, the information you need to figure out if you have a problem. So the types of things that you can figure out pretty easily using this are which users are getting prompted all the time, 
Are there applications that are causing the user to be prompted all the time? Like we found that there are SaaS applications out there that have bad integration recommendations that will automatically cause the user to be prompted a lot. And then what is the state of the device? And I really want to focus on that one. So our second recommendation that we uh, implement with, MD or with enterprise customers is getting them to enroll into MDM. We do still come across organizations that are not using MDM on Mac OS. Uh, it's not common anymore, but it does exist out there. And one of the reasons why we need them to implement MDM is MDM is the only modern way to deploy enterprise features to Mac OS. Like these enterprise security features that we're gonna talk about, reducing these auth prompts, uh, getting antivirus onto the devices, uh, doing identity correctly on the Mac devices, these things all require that the device is under MDM management. So we can improve device security by integrating with things like conditional access that I told you about before, and we can also improve that end user experience. Um, one point of confusion that often comes up here is uh, you don't need to do both. Like if you don't want to use conditional access, but you still want SSO for your Office 365 applications and other things in Azure AD, you can do that. Uh, vice versa, if you don't care about SSO for some reason, uh, and you do want the device identity stuff in conditional access, you can do that as well. They're separate but related features. Uh, if you are a Microsoft Endpoint Manager customer, or in what used to be called Intune, uh, this all works pretty much out of the box. So if that's your MDM of choice, we integrate with them natively. However, uh, if you don't, um, I know a lot of my customers use Jamf Pro instead of uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager for their Macs. We can still do an integration that lets you get that compliance information and the health information about the Macs into our services. And it's really, really critical that customers do that. Um, so if you use Jamf Pro, uh, this is pretty well documented. Uh, if you use another MDM or you work at another MDM that you don't see on the list here as one of our MDM partners, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to put you in touch with the folks that can help you get on this list uh, because I think that it's really critical for our shared customers that they're able to do this type of integration. Uh, because it's really critical to understand without a MDM or an MDM that's integrated into Microsoft Endpoint Manager, Azure AD is going to see every Mac in your organization as unmanaged. We will have no data about it. So if your identity teams are creating really, really stringent policies around who can access what uh, on unmanaged devices, that is going to impact all of your Mac users without doing this type of MDM management. So our recommendation here is enroll into MDM. Uh, the process is really, really simple. If MEM's the MDM, basically you do your MDM enrollment, you create a policy that says what the device has to do to be compliant, and then the flow is that Intune reports that data to the Intune Cloud Service, and the Intune Cloud Service basically uh, tells Azure AD whether the device is compliant or not. And all Azure AD cares about is the thumbs up or the thumbs down. If you use another MDM, it's really, really simple as well. Uh, there's basically an API in the Intune service that your MDM can integrate with, and it can report the same information. So from the identity perspective, you gotta do one of these two things. The other thing that MDM enrollment allows you to do is, is to set up your SSO infrastructure. And this is really what we need a lot of customers to do in order to improve the end user experience portion of security on Mac OS. So just to provide a little history lesson on what exists in Mac OS for uh, SSO capabilities, Macs have for a long time had the ability to bind to LDAP directories, like very commonly Active Directory. Uh, but Apple has, for a couple years, been signaling to customers that they really shouldn't be going in this direction. Uh, so if your organization is still using LDAP bind, uh, please get away from it. Uh, better is Apple's Kerberos SSO extension, and this has to be deployed through MDM. Uh, so if you are not using MDM, you cannot do the modern way of integrating with an LDAP directory, and you're going to be stuck in the past. Um, and there's some reasons why, some other reasons why you probably want to get on an MDM because more and more Apple is deploying new features that require MDM as the method for deployment. The modern way to do SSO is via tokens, and this is the part I'm really going to focus on. So uh, IDP vendors can create plugins for what's called Apple's Extensible Enterprise SSO Framework. 
so I'm an, I, I come from an IDP vendor, so uh, Microsoft has gone and, do, and done this. Some of our uh, competitors and other IDPs out in, the, uh, out in the world are doing this as well. Um, and fundamentally, things work pretty similarly. Um, again, this has to be deployed through an MDM. So if you're integrating with cloud services, uh, your, integration, or your uh, identity services need to be coming through an MDM in order to be modern. There's actually two types of these uh, SSO extensions that we can build. Azure AD's type is what's called the redirect type, so I'm primarily gonna focus on that. So really quickly, uh, why don't we want users to use Kerberos anymore? So if you are using, uh, this doesn't really matter if you're using the LDAP bind method or if you're using the uh, more modern Kerberos SSO extension from Apple, or if you're actually using a third-party tool like Jamf Connect would be the common one that we see, it fundamentally works the same way. Kerberos is really an artifact of on-premise directory services, and in the security world, those are not as relevant as they used to be. Like I said at the beginning of the talk, a lot of resources are moving to the cloud, and so it doesn't necessarily make sense for our tokens that we use to access services to come from an on-prem directory. So, in the Kerberos world, regardless of which uh, tool you're actually using, the user basically authenticates to the device either at the lock screen, if you're doing some password synchronization, or once they land on the home screen and the device detects it has line of sight to a domain controller, it's gonna ask for username and password. Active Directory is fairly old at this point, and it only really understands two ways to authenticate, username and password or certificate, that's it. So in most orgs, this is username and password. The device sends those creds to Active Directory and asks for what's called a TGT. Active Directory validates those creds, and if they're valid, it hands back the TGT. The user tries to access an app, so this could be a, a Kerberos integrated web app, uh, it could be a file share, it could be a print server, it doesn't really matter, uh, but they need some sort of artifact to get access to that Kerberos application. If anybody's a Kerberos expert, you'll notice this is like a big oversimplification, but hopefully that's okay. So what does the Mac do? It sends that TGT to Active Directory and it asks for a ticket that is specific to the application that the user wants access to. Active Directory validates that TGT and returns what's called a TGS. The user's browser or whatever client they're using sends the TGS to the app and the user is successfully authenticated. It's pretty straightforward stuff. This has been built into Mac OS for like 20-ish years. Just to illustrate what this might look like on a Mac, uh, this is just from my lab environment. Uh, we have a TGT uh, that gives me access to whatever I might need. Uh, basically, it's just good for exchanging to a domain controller and uh, getting those TGSs. And then you can see here, I have a TGS that's specific to a file share. So let's look at where this breaks down. So, this doesn't really work over the internet. So as we start to see more SaaS applications proliferate, Kerberos is gonna make less and less sense. So if we have a SaaS application instead of an internal Kerberos app, uh, what's going to happen is that the device is going to look for a domain controller, be unable to find one, the user can't get a ticket, and therefore they're not gonna be able to authenticate. So in this case, the user provides the device with their username and password, and what should the device do? Uh, you, know, you might say it should go find a domain controller, but the only way to do that is gonna be to use a VPN. And another trend we've seen with customers is that it is not necessarily a good idea to be piping all traffic over your VPN back into your on-prem network. Uh, there's a lot of uh, compromises that can happen that way. And so the user doesn't have access to their application. And so this is why Apple built the enterprise SSO framework. As more and more of these applications have been moving to the cloud, more resources are in the cloud, Macs were kind of stuck in the past with the way that they did integrations with uh, modern cloud services and uh, modern applications. So Apple, a couple versions ago, built their uh, framework and we have built software on top of it. Uh, they're actually going to be making this framework even more powerful in the future, so it's a really good idea for organizations to, one, understand how this stuff works, and two, start thinking about deploying it. So the solution here is to use modern authentication. So SAML is good, uh, but OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 are better. Uh, but the key advantage of modern authentication is that it's web-based. So here we have the Azure AD login page, but could be any, any IDP uh, web authentication has been around for a long time. But the web gives us flexibility. 
We can do things like challenge for certificates. We can use FIDO-based credentials. Uh, we can use authenticator apps. Um, we can do all sorts of crazy things to the session once we've given the user a token back, like direct it through a proxy service. There's a lot of things that are made possible by using web-based authentication instead of this old Kerberos stuff that only applied to on-prem Active Directory. So before I tell you how our plugin works, it's really important to understand a couple key artifacts that are relevant to pretty much any device that integrates with Azure AD. So this goes for Windows, this goes for iOS, Android, Mac OS, and Linux as of a couple days ago. Uh, and just to reiterate, our goal is to prompt once per user, per device, uh, per password change. So unless something has changed, we don't want uh, to be prompting those end users. And so the primary artifact that we need in order to power this experience with Azure AD is what's called a primary refresh token. So this is basically a long-term authentication token that is held by a broker application on whatever the OS is. Uh, so just like that Kerberos TGT is a long-term session token that the user gets when they sign into their Mac, in this case, the primary refresh token is kind of like the modern replacement for it. Windows devices use these uh, and have had support for them for a number of years. Um, and now we are bringing this capability to the Mac as well. The primary refresh token is used to acquire other assets, like a refresh token access token pair that is specific to the application that the user is trying to get into. So if the user is trying to access Exchange Online, uh, they might go to Azure AD and say, here's my PRT. I would like a token for Exchange Online. And what they're going to get in return is a refresh token that's good for a really long time and can carry things like multi-factor claims in it and an access token. And the access token is really, really short-lived. And so you remember earlier I said that it's important that we're constantly reevaluating policy uh, to see if something's changed, if we need to revoke access, block a user from getting access to a service, challenge for MFA, things like that. The way we do that is by whatever the client application is, coming back and asking for fresh access tokens on roughly an hourly basis. So, Applications that interact with cloud IDPs on Macs have used access tokens and refresh tokens for a long time. Really, the new thing is the PRT. So there's a couple things that a Mac needs, or that an environment needs to have to actually leverage this. So one is the apps have to be using modern auth, uh, and you have to be using the modern auth SSO uh, framework. So uh, you have to have a modern IDP. Azure AD is ours. There's other ones on the market. Uh, the apps have to integrate with that IDP. Your IDP vendor has to go create an SSO extension plugin. I know we've done it. I know one other vendor's done it. Uh, I'm sure other ones are working on it. You have to have those Macs under MDM management. And then uh, the other thing that uh, you need is what's called the Microsoft Company Portal app. And again, just to reiterate, you don't actually have to use Intune or Microsoft Endpoint Manager as your MDM of choice. Really, the Company Portal app here is just a delivery vehicle for the SSO code. So uh, if you don't want to use our MDM, totally fine. You can still deploy the company portal app and just use it for this, this SSO piece. So just like before, we need to have the user authenticate, establish a session, and get a PRT instead of that TGT. So in this case, the user authenticates to the SSO extension, and we can have them do it using more types of credentials than we did in the past. So again, on-prem Active Directory doesn't really understand a lot. Uh, Azure AD in the cloud supports passwordless authentication, username, password, plus MFA, a whole bunch of other stuff. So we can do a stronger way of signing in uh, in order to get that user access. Then, with those credentials in hand, the uh, SSO extension in the company portal will go acquire that PRT from Azure AD. This doesn't require line of sight to domain controllers, doesn't require that the device is on-prem, just needs to have an internet connection so it can reach our URLs. Uh, then that PRT is stored in the keychain uh, on the device. Uh, just to call out, PRTs are good for a rolling 14-day window. Uh, they're constantly refreshed when the user uses the Mac, though. So as long as they're using the Mac uh, at least once every 14 days and have an internet connection, this thing should be refreshed uh, pretty much indefinitely, unless you set a policy to stop that. So, one other wrinkle is that there's actually two different flows for applications to ask us to go get tokens on their behalf. Uh, so I'm going to start with what's called the MSAL flow. MSAL is Microsoft Authentication Library. It's just an open source auth library that we create. 
uh, that you can put in your own applications if you want to integrate them with Azure AD and make it easy on yourself uh, instead of using a different auth library. So basically, if you have an application that knows about mSAL, it can talk directly to our SSO broker and say, go get me a token. And just like in the Kerberos example, except this time using modern tokens and the web, uh, the broker can send the PRT to Azure AD, say, I want a token for the application. So in this case, it might be Outlook and Exchange Online. Azure AD validates that the PRT is still good, and if everything is happy, it returns the access token and a refresh token along with it. And then it's just passed to the application, and the application gets access, or the uh, client application gets access to the cloud service. So it's pretty straightforward. Where Apple really did some magic in the OS is for applications that don't use Microsoft Auth Library. Uh, there's a big need for SSO in pretty much any application, and this includes things like Safari, VPN apps, any other client application that might uh, be out there. We've started to see some vendors uh, start to adopt this, and they look and say, I need to support a lot of IDPs. I don't want to build with Microsoft's auth libraries. So there is a method in Mac OS to provide this SSO capability without uh, using our auth libraries. So just like before, the user might try to get into their application, and their application is going to say, you need a token. Go to this Azure AD URL to get it. Uh, if that app doesn't use mSAL, so like Safari is a really good example. Of course, Apple is not going to use Microsoft's auth library. Uh, so what happens here is the Mac OS network stack basically intercepts the traffic and redirects it to the SSO extension. This is a really powerful capability, and one that is potentially ripe for uh, abuse in a uh, poorly managed environment. So Apple mandates that this capability be delivered through an MDM, and this is where a lot of the MDM requirement comes from. But basically, the same as before, the traffic is redirected to the, uh, the authentication traffic is redirected to the SSO extension. It uses its PRT to request a new token, and that token is returned to the client application, and the user gets access to their app. And so this works in non-Microsoft applications. So these have to be deployed through MDM because essentially you're doing some form of man in the middle on your own uh, traffic on the device. We made it really easy, like if you use Microsoft Endpoint Manager, you barely have to configure anything. Um, I did write a guide for Jamf Pro because every time I talk to a Jamf Pro customer, they misconfigured this uh, just because there were too many settings to set. Uh, so we wrote a Jamf Pro specific guide. And basically what you configure is uh, the bundle identifier of the app that is going to receive the traffic, the list of URLs that are going to be redirected. So this ideally should only include Microsoft URLs. Uh, if you see other URLs in this list, someone might be doing something malicious. Uh, and then some uh, configuration items that go into a plist, basically specifying what client applications on the device should participate in this whole scheme. And then uh, you're pretty much up and running. If you follow our recommended config, you can actually ha uh, set it so that the user never even needs to open the company portal application. In this example, I actually opened Safari in private browsing mode, and I got this little pop-up, and that is just the SSO extension uh, at the o uh, being prompted at the OS level to get provisioned. Uh, so it's pretty slick. The key thing to understand is that the company portal just has to be there on the device. So a few limitations to call out. Uh, the SSO extension from Microsoft is still in public preview. There's a couple bugs that we're still working out uh, before we declare general availability on this, but it is supported. So we do have customers who are actively deploying this, so this does exist in the wild today. Uh, apps have to use either our auth library or Apple's system frameworks for network requests. That means that there's some applications that will not participate in this SSO scheme. Uh, so the SSO extension is unaware of them, and the operating system is unaware of that auth traffic. Chrome and Firefox are the primary examples. Uh, so if anybody in the room works for Google, please try to get the Chrome people to adopt this stuff. Um, but today, these are basically the ones that don't work. I'm sure there's other stuff out there. Uh, any customer we talk to, we push them to talk to their vendors about supporting SSO extensions. Um, especially in the future in Ventura, there's going to be more capabilities for this. This framework is basically going to be extended to the Mac OS lock screen. And so IDP vendors who build these uh, platform or build these SSO extensions will be able to take advantage of what's called platform SSO to allow the user to sign into the Mac using credentials from the IDP at the lock screen. 
Uh, so this is a, a new capability from Apple that's gonna be coming out uh, soon, and IDP vendors are gonna be uh, working on adopting it. So uh, it's really, really important that we understand how to deploy this, how they work, uh, because they're only getting more important in the future. This is basically the modern replacement for LDAP bind. Uh, one other problem with this is that FIDO keys are not supported as a passwordless auth method to bootstrap that SSO extension. So if you saw that SSO extension window, you cannot use a FIDO key to bootstrap that thing. It's a limitation from Apple, unfortunately. Uh, so if you do wanna do passwordless, we recommend using the Microsoft Authenticator app or similar options. So I do wanna do a quick aside on Jamf Connect and some other tools because uh, these are tools that are being used at the lock screen uh, to do sort of a IDP vendor-based sign-in um, because a lot of times uh, they, the organizations wanna get the flexibility of modern auth uh, but still have some of the uh, control that the Kerberos SSO extension provides. So uh, doing MFA at the lock screen is like one of the big motivators I see with customers. But I really wanna caution people about how you set these up. Um, so one is you can't check for device compliance at the lock screen. Uh, there's stuff in the keychain that we need that's just not available at the lock screen. Uh, and then you're going to, if you do this incorrectly, uh, you're going to see sign-in failures in your Azure AD sign-in logs. And typically our machine learning algorithm is gonna think that you're password spraying yourself and it's gonna lock user accounts out. So you need to be really careful about how this gets configured. This specifically happens because customers use a protocol called ROPC, or Resource Owner Password uh, Credential Grant. Um, ROPC does not have a user interactive component. It does use HTTP as the transport protocol, uh, but we cannot interact with the end user. We just get an HTTP post, and that's it. So if Azure AD can't challenge the user for MFA, but there's a policy that says we have to do MFA, the user's gonna get blocked. So, uh, there is an app registration component to this, and basically what the flow looks like is you have a user, and the user tosses their credentials into the Jamf uh, Connect um, client, and then that client sends that information to Azure AD. If there's no policy in the way, basically we can issue out all the tokens that you need, and everybody's happy, and everything's good. However, if there is a conditional access policy that applies to all cloud apps, this is basically a wild card in our world, the end result will be no tokens for the user, uh, no MFA challenge, and a failed sign-in. Uh, so this is really bad from Azure AD's perspective. Uh, I went to the Jamf conference last week, and I'm gonna try to talk to some people at Jamf about how we can revise some of the guidance for this. Uh, but today, it's really common in organizations to see lots of users get flagged as compromised, so just something to look out for if you go down the Jamf Connect road. Again, talk to your identity team uh, if some of this is happening. All right, the fourth thing that we're working on with Mac customers is adopting passwordless. Um, the reasons we wanna do this are, uh, there's a couple. One is the Authenticator app is a really good passwordless option for our Mac users because it pretty much works in any browser on the Mac, like Safari, Chrome, Firefox, you name it. Um, and the Authenticator app can be used for exact, the exact same PRT SSO stuff I just showed you, but on iOS instead. So the Authenticator app is our broker on iOS, the company portal is our app on uh, Mac OS. We also have uh, some modes in it that make it more resistant to the, some of that MFA hammering that we talked about earlier. Uh, so it is a good option for organizations to look at. Uh, passwordless also provides the best combination of user experience and security. Uh, just to prove that it's actually possible, Mark and I have been passwordless since like the week before Thanksgiving in 2020. Like I don't know what my password is at Microsoft, I don't use it. Um, I haven't used it in like two years. Uh, it's totally possible to uh, go passwordless, and it means that I am much, much more difficult to fish than your average end user. Not impossible to trick me to do something stupid, but uh, it's, it's much more difficult. So the options on Mac are things like uh, Authenticator app. Uh, you can also use FIDO2 keys. Uh, FIDO2 keys are probably the strongest security method that we, uh, security authentication method that we have. Um, Today they only work in Edge and Chrome. They don't work in Safari with Azure AD. That's our fault, not Apple's. We're working on that. Um, and then the thing that's happening in the future is gonna be pass keys. So passwordless is going to be a ever more important topic for our enterprise customers, um, especially with the emergence of pass keys as a standard. Uh, so something to think about for your own organizations as time goes on. 
And finally, uh, the fifth thing is that if you go through all the work in, in the enterprise of adopting all the stuff that we just talked about, it doesn't really do you very much good if your applications are still integrated with an on-prem Active Directory or other LDAP uh, directory. So uh, in those environments, you really need to start adopting uh, SSO. Um, so adopt modern authentication, integrate those applications with Azure AD. We can publish, or your IDP of choice. It doesn't have to be us, we like it to be us. Um, but if it's Azure AD, we can publish all sorts of stuff. Like again, the modern auth applications are really easy. Uh, we can publish on-premise legacy Kerberos applications and put them behind Azure AD. We can do password, weird password-based stuffing stuff for password applications. We've got integrations with partners all over the place uh, if you have other use cases. We try to make this really easy for customers. Like we have this big app gallery. This is pretty standard in the industry at this point. Um, so if you go down the road of uh, starting to play around with this stuff and you're finding that some of your applications are not participating in this SSO stuff, you can actually reach out to us. We have uh, an aka.ms link there at the bottom uh, that you can use to actually reach out to Microsoft and say, Microsoft, I'd really like you to uh, go work with my app vendor of choice to get this integrated into your environment and we'll go do it for you. So we try to make it easy on people. So just to recap, a couple go do's uh, that we're working on with our enterprise customers. One is working with the identity and security teams on the end user experience. Again, a lot of these environments, they don't know what's going wrong, uh, so we're trying to make it easier for them to figure that out. Macs need to be managed by an MDM, and that probably goes for iOS devices as well. Uh, pretty much any device that is going to be accessing corporate resources on a consistent basis needs to be in an MDM. Uh, but especially for the Macs, there is not a lot we can do to improve end user experience or security on a Mac without MDM. Uh, so it's time if you haven't gone down this road yet. If, you're, uh, if you have your Macs under MDM management and you use Office 365 or Azure AD or any of our stuff, please deploy our SSO extension. If you use one of, our, uh, one of the other IDPs out on the market, do theirs. Um, it's, it's fine, like if you don't want to use Microsoft stuff, I totally understand. But uh, whatever IDP vendor you're using, it is really important to start adopting SSO because the user experience historically on Macs with cloud IDPs has been very poor and it's damaging security in the industry. So deploy those SSO extensions. Nudge your users towards passwordless. If you use Microsoft, again, Microsoft Authenticator is a really easy option to get started with on iOS and Android. Um, but there are other options out there. If you want to use smart cards and certificates, FIDO keys, stuff like that, um, those are all really good. In the future, hopefully pass keys is an option here as well. And then more SSO. It's time to modernize applications. We really shouldn't be building stuff that's built on Kerberos. Uh, we want customers to start adopting. And one final thing that I didn't put in the slides, but I really think is important for this community, is that uh, if you're not aware of this SSO stuff, it's still really new. Like Microsoft still hasn't shipped our SSO extension to general availability. Some of the other IDPs I think are in a preview state as well. Um, so if you're curious about this stuff, come talk to me, come talk to Mark, find us on Twitter. Uh, we would be really, really happy to get security researchers looking at some of this uh, and trying to find out if there's rough edges or bad implementations on our side or bad things on Apple's side. We think this is the future for macOS, and it's really important that this adoption goes well. So if you want to help us in any way, please reach out. I am happy to work with you. And with that, thank you. Uh, I will post these slides on my GitHub at that link there, uh, aka.ms slash aadobts22. And thanks for your time. Uh, I can take questions if you want. Uh, so we took our own auth library and built it into Edge. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was about uh, how do we do SSO in Edge, uh, because I didn't mention that. So we took our own auth library and we built it into Edge. Uh, we have not done any work yet to upstream that into Chromium, but I think that's a good idea. Uh, it's Okta.
I haven't tested myself. Uh, sorry, the question was um, around there's no support for using a FIDO key in the auth window for the SSO extension. Is that changing in Ventura? My understanding is no, Ventura will have the same limitation. Yep. Next question. So uh, the question was around uh, pass keys and the, and the shareable nature of them and how I see the industry evolving around pass keys being shareable. Um, so I can't speak for Apple, and I, I won't try to. Um, on the Microsoft side, uh, one of the things that we're working on with pass keys is the ability to have uh, syncable ones and non-syncable ones and having a method to have attestation from the OS that the pass key was hardware bound and not exportable. So I think the Windows implementation will probably have something that looks like that, where um, in your IDP, you'd be able to say, uh, you know, to access application one, I'll allow syncable pass keys. But this other application is really sensitive. And so I'm going to force it to only accept non-syncable pass keys. Cool. Uh, question in the back? So the question was about how to get visibility into what's going on with some of the modern auth protocols. Um, there's some really good tools for debugging uh, modern auth protocols. It's all web-based, so fundamentally, um, all you really need is like Fiddler, uh, or uh, in your browser, there's things like SAML X-Ray and uh, other plugins for browsers that can make it really easy to grab that traffic and inspect it. Uh, I think the tougher part is understanding how the protocols are intended to work, uh, because you could look at an OpenID Connect authentication and have no idea uh, how it works. So uh, we have documentation on our site, on our uh, docs pages, that covers how our protocols work that we support in Azure AD. Um, I know other IDP vendors have very similar stuff. So between using something like Fiddler to collect the data and doing some research on how the protocols work, that'll probably get you most of the way to understanding like what's happening when a user authenticates. Um, if you're asking specifically about our SSO extension, uh, there is a method, uh, if you deploy it, to go to the help menu and you can say like dump logs and it'll throw all the logs from the SSO extension into a file on the disk. Uh, so if you wanna inspect what we're doing on the device, you can do that as well. Um, we added that just a couple months ago. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs>